Well, then let me go ahead and start then. I want to welcome everyone, uh, especially our visitors tonight. And uh, my name is Monty Murray. I'm president of the South Wake Conservationists. And we are a chapter of the North Carolina Wildlife Federation serving Southern Wake County and the surrounding area. Uh, our mission is to conserve and improve wildlife habitat and diversity through conservation projects and public outreach like this one tonight. Now, if I can just advance the slide, there we go. Um, I, before we um, move on to our featured speaker tonight, I just want to give a quick update on some things that are happening with the chapter. Um, just within the last uh, month or so, we've had a number of activities and a couple of things that are, are still upcoming this month. We had a really good native plant sale thanks to uh, generous contributions of plants from the Wildlife Federation as well as from Chad Chandler, who personally uh, started a number of different native plants. We had a great time. Uh, it went really well. <clears throat> and we partnered with the Simple Gifts Community Garden in uh, Apex and uh, held the sale at the garden. So we kind of did a uh, a double feature where people get tours of the community garden and also buy some native plants uh, while they're there. So it was a pretty good, pretty good event. Um, we've also continued with our community engagement. We do exhibits throughout the year at various public events. And uh, the latest ones we did, we were at the NC State Fair partnering with the Native Plant Society. And that's what this photo is showing. And then our, our next one and our last one is at the Good Hope Farm Harvest Fest, which is in Cary. And that's in a couple of weeks. Um, so we're looking forward to that. And that'll be a total of nine public events where we've been, you know, just sharing the conservation message with everybody. We're continuing our Eco Kids program. Uh, we had a really fun event at Bass Lake Park last month um, with a large uh, group of homeschoolers that came from various families that networked together. And uh, it was all about the Red Wolves. And everybody really had a good time. And we partnered with the champions of for wildlife uh, who came all the way from Western North Carolina to help uh, facilitate that session. Uh, it was really a lot of fun and I think the kids really enjoyed it. I know I did. And then there's the pollinator gardens of which we have at least seven now throughout the county and, and, and counting and invasive plant removal. That's kind of an ongoing thing that, that, that we do. And we have work days, uh, I had one yesterday. There's other ones coming up. And we did Crowder Park, Yates Mill Park, Bass Lake Park is in a couple of weeks. And we just kind of keep at it. And you can see uh, we kind of threw uh, Luke into the wheelbarrow there with the weeds, which uh, I don't know if he appreciated that or not, but we had fun with it. Uh, and then the Bluebird House Installation is another program that we've got going. And uh, we've done a number of parks and schools, and we just installed six more Bluebird Houses at Lake Wheeler Park. And that's what you're seeing there. So I encourage everybody to subscribe to our website. You see it there on the bottom of your screen and uh, watch the calendar and join us when you can. You know, if you see something you'd like to do and it's a nice day and let's go, you know, let's go make something happen for conservation. Join us. Everybody's welcome. And as you can see, we have a lot of fun. You know, that's really whatever we're doing. It's just kind of fun doing it as a group. Um, I'd like to now tell you about our guest speaker tonight, which is Dr. Lewis Daniel, which we're very happy to have him here this evening to speak to us about our Save Our Sounds. Um, his 30 year career has been centered on protecting our national marine resources. He has a bachelor's in marine science from Wake Forest University. He has a master's in marine science from the College of Charleston. He has a PhD in marine biology and biological oceanography from the College of William and Mary. Uh, he started out as a fisheries biologist with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, and then for over 20 years, he was with the MC Division of Marine Fisheries, serving nine years as the division director. Uh, he's now an adjunct professor at NC State University. He teaches a class on marine fisheries management and policy, and he is a senior marine scientist at the North Carolina Wildlife Federation, and he's been doing that since 2016, and he's now leading this critical Save Our Sounds program, which you're going to hear about tonight. Please note, and you're going to learn more about this in uh, as the evening progresses, but our fisheries are in serious trouble. And Dr. Daniel has an important message and a call to action for us tonight. So uh, I think you're going to find this a very worthwhile evening. 
But before we begin, um, I'd like to introduce Luke Bennett, who is our conservation coordinator with the North Carolina Wildlife Federation. And he's going to explain some of the logistics around how we're going to handle the webinar this evening and how you can ask questions. And he's going to run an introductory video for us and then turn it over to Dr. Daniel. So Luke, over to you. Thanks, Monty. Uh, yeah, just a couple of quick things. Uh, we do encourage folks to ask questions tonight. If you would like to do so, please type that question into the chat or the Q&A. You can do that at any time during the presentation. It's not gonna mess anything up. If a question pops in your head, feel free to just type it in there. And at the end, we'll save some time to uh, address those questions, uh, You know, get a chance to ask Dr. Daniel all your burning questions about this topic. And now to get us in the mood, I guess you could say, I'm gonna show a quick video. Our shallow sounds are in deep trouble, North Carolina, and we need to throw them a lifeline. Inshore shrimp trawling has destroyed our seafloors. Day after day, a handful of boats, many from out of state, relentlessly attack and prevent recovery of what little is left of our coastal resources. As many as 100,000 times each year, chains drag their net to cross an environment stripped bare of its once vast seagrass meadows, oyster beds, and living bottom. Stirring up mud and blanketing the nurseries of hundreds of species and sediment are releasing trapped toxins into the water column, continuing to disrupt oyster beds and destroy sensitive habitat. For every pound of shrimp they harvest, they discard at least four pounds of bycatch. That's 30 million pounds of dead sea life in a year. Hundreds of millions of immature fish killed before they can spawn and rebuild sustainability. Bottom trawls drastically deplete the food sources of many species important to the ecosystem. Dolphins and porpoises, whales, sea turtles, manatees, birds, fish, crabs, and shrimp. And we, their caretakers, are all negatively impacted. Yet we're the only state on the east and gulf coast that continues to allow large-scale trawling in its estuaries. And this, we're all alone. It's not because of bad people, it's simply poor management and our environment pays the ultimate price. Our sounds are no safe harbor for the creatures that count on them for refuge. Let's at long last give our resources a fighting chance. After all, they're resources that belong to all of us. Nature is part of our heritage, North Carolina. So let's act together to close our estuaries to large scale bottom trawling before rescue is out of reach. Secure our seagrass meadows, safeguard our sea life, sustain our seafood, save our sounds. Paid for by the North Carolina Wildlife Federation. All right, Lewis, I'm going to share your presentation here and hand it over to you. All right. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Yeah. Good, good, good. good. All right. Well, thank you, um, Luke. And and first, I'd like to thank Monty for um, hosting this uh, hosting this event. Um, I, I think that, you know, looking at what you just presented um, early before the before the video and the work on Red Wolves and other things, I mean, I think I think the chapter work is so critical for us getting our message out and and especially for those issues that are that may be uh political or or controversial you know have it, having the support of our chapter network um you know from from elk in maggie valley to marine fisheries on the coast is, is such a critical um part of our success if we're going to get if we're going to have success so um I wanted to just kind of emphasize one point that was made in the video. And that's where Eddie says they're not bad people, it's bad management. And I, and I want people to keep that in mind. 
it's not it's not bad people with bad hearts and it, it it's just the fact that we've not been able to to manage our fisheries based on good sound science and that's what's led us to the to the to the place we are today. So, and I also wanted to say hi to Tara. We miss her, and I'm glad she joined us tonight. So that's a that's a treat for me. So I'll get started. What I'm going to do is go through the presentation that I gave at the annual meeting, and uh, kind of expand on it a little bit. Um, and then Luke, if you have questions, please send them to Luke or post them, and we'll try to get to as many as we possibly can. So for those of you that are here, instead of watching the Hurricanes hockey game, um, that's where I'll be after, after we're done. So um, we're going to have a hard stop at 8.15. <laughs> um, so to start, the, the a key element of fisheries management in North Carolina, um, after years of political wrangling and problems and issues, was the Fisheries Reform Act of 1997. And that was developed by the General Assembly with help from the Moratorium Steering Committee to develop fishery management plans to rebuild overfish stocks and to maintain a sustainable harvest. Um, fishery management plans are developed by the Division of Marine Fisheries, the agency that I was involved in for about 23 years. And through a, through a stakeholder advisory panel and approved by the Marine Fisheries Commission, these plans were supposed to have the measures that were needed in order to properly manage these resources. But as we pass the 25th anniversary of this act, no stock, no stock has been rebuilt or has produced a validated sustainable harvest. Um, so in the first slide, um, the Sound Solutions Program was developed by the Wildlife Federation to address this shortcoming. And what we did was we sat down and we thought about what, what are the key issues that we need to address? There's so many issues related to marine fisheries that we need to address, but what are the key issues that we feel we need to focus our effort and attention and not let other issues come in and sideline us from, from working on these critical issues. And there were three, the, 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 the sound solutions program is made up of three key points. One is to reform our commercial license structure, um, to only permit those documented fishermen who sell seafood to a licensed dealer to continue to allow to fish. Right now we have numerous people that buy commercial fishing licenses that don't sell their catch. And so none of those catches are reported. So you can imagine how difficult it is to try to assess what's going on in the population if you don't know what's being taken out of the population. And so what we believe is that commercial fishing licenses should go to those people who make a living selling seafood to a licensed dealer so that all that harvest can be accounted for and quantified in population stock assessments. One of the big problems with that not having that information is that what it tends to suggest is that all our population stock assessments, which for the most part are very, very bad, are actually better than, are actually in worse condition than the stock assessment indicates. So that's one issue, license reform. The second is to consolidate all of our, man, of our fish and wildlife management into one agency that represents all of the citizens of our state. You know, one of the points that made in the video is that these are public trust resources. Public trust resources mean they belong to everybody equally in the state. So the little old lady that sits in Boone and just likes to know that there's trout swimming around in the sounds has just as much right to those fish as the commercial fishermen or the recreational fishermen that go out and pursue them every day or during the season. And finally, the big one of the biggest issues that we're dealing with is shrimp trawling in the sounds, um, in the estuaries. Estuaries are the nursery habitat, and and our goal since I started with the federation in 2016 has been to try to reduce this greatest source of mortality and habitat damage in North Carolina. So our next slide, the sound solution, the Save Our Sounds campaign. 
which is in the next slide. Let's see if we get there. I'm trying to advance it for you here, Lewis. Do what? I'm trying to advance it for you here. Oh, no, that's fine. Okay. All right, we're good. <laughs> Okay, so the Save Our Sounds Kit, so there's the Sound Solutions Program, and then there's the Save Our Sounds Campaign, and that was specifically developed to address the shrimp trawl component of Sound Solutions. So the video is an effort to generate education and interest related to this critical topic that directly impacts the management of our these valuable public trust resources. And while a goal of the Fisheries Reform Act was to end overfishing, and rebuild overfish stocks to sustainable levels. Again, after 25 years, the opposite has happened. Um, no stocks have recovered and many have actually collapsed and, are, and or are collapsing. And some have actually been, been moved into the endangered, onto the endangered species, the federal endangered species list. Next slide. The, 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 the fisheries literature indicates that a stock may be considered collapsed if the current landings are less than 10% of the average three years highest landings. And collapsed is a far worse condition than overfished in most cases. And so if you look at these commercial landings, you can see that if, when I, I went in and I, I looked at the three highest years of landings of blue crab, Averaged them together, they came up to about 61 million pounds. And the most recent year's landings data from 2022, the landings had dropped to 9.5 million. So that's an 86% decline. Remember, 10%, if it was 90%, that blue crabs would be considered collapsed. So these, this stock is collapsing and the stock is declining. Atlantic croaker, which Atlantic croaker, spot, and weak fish are, are a trio of fishes that were the really the anchor of many of the inshore fisheries in decades past. They were the critical aspects of the pound net fishery, the long haul same fishery, the gill net fishery on the commercial side. But then they were also critical components to the pier fishery, the recreational small boat fishery. You know, people would go out and catch large quant you know, quantities of croaker spot and weak fish. And that was sort of the every man's fish. And, 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 and they were also relatively inexpensive so that they were able to get out to the public. And as you can see, the cumulative landings of those three species, croaker spot and weak fish over the three highest years was a combined close to 20, 35, 45 million pounds a year. And, and, and now those stocks have declined from around 21 million pounds for croaker down to less, almost a half, of, less, around a half a million pounds in 2021. The low landings of spot occurred in 2018 with 167,000 pounds, still not in there, and the landings are still down around 180, 190,000. So they're not rapidly climbing back up. Weak fish is a, is a, is a catastrophe where the landings were 17 million and now they're 35,000 pounds landed commercially. Southern flounder. So you can see that for the majority of these species on the right hand side, a 97% reduction means Atlantic croaker, croaker are collapsed, as our spot, as our weak fish, and technically southern flounder. And so if we look at the total there, Overall, 90% decline on these key five species that really have made up a tremendous component of the North Carolina um, commercial fishery. So if we look at the next slide, we'll see the recreational data. And it pretty much shows us the same thing, all right? And so what a lot of people will say is, well, you know, I've heard this so many times like, well, we don't, we don't, people don't want spot anymore, or people don't want to fish for croaker. Anymore. People don't want to eat by croaker anymore. We know that everybody loves a flounder. All right. And so, and we don't have any data on blue crab recreational data. 
because we just don't have the information and, and there's not license. They don't have to have a license to harvest crabs in North Carolina. Shellfish are not under a license. So, but if, but if the Atlantic croaker that were producing 20 million pounds commercial and a million and a half pounds recreational, if the, all of a sudden the commercial fishermen just stopped fishing for them, you would expect that there would be more fish available to the recreational fishery and their landings would go up. <clears throat> but that's not what we're seeing. So we're, we've seen a virtual collapse in Atlantic croaker, a collapse in spot weak fish, and a significant decline in southern flounder. One of the reasons why we don't see the significant decline in southern flounder like we have in these other species and like we saw in the commercial fishery is because I believe the, the, the regulations that have been implemented for southern flounder, albeit insufficient to rebuild the stock, have resulted in abundances of southern flounder increasing, which is a good thing, but they're not increased as much as they need to in order to be declared recovered. And so what that has done is that has recently in the last four or five years that has actually allowed more southern flounder to be available for harvest by the recreational fishery. So that's one of the reasons why their landings have not come down as much as one might expect in, in a collapsed fishery. Next, next, uh, next slide. So just to give you kind of an example, um, the, the, this is, these are landings of commercial landings of blue crab. So that, that's all we, that's all we have is commercial landings on blue crab. And, and that was the first FMP that was required to be developed in the, from the Fisheries Reform Act. And that had to be completed by January 1st of 1999. And I think that's this is a striking example. The blue crab fishery in, in North Carolina is managed with virtually no limits. So there are no pot limits or harvest limits on, on commercial crabbing in North Carolina. And as a result, more and more pots are needed to catch fewer and fewer crabs. So you can imagine if you used to be able to go out in your farm pond and set up a trap and catch enough crayfish for an afternoon for a meal. And then all of a sudden it gets to the point where you got to set 10 minute pots to catch enough crawfish to have a meal. You know, you got a problem with your population. You're not, you're not having the, the catch per unit of effort that you need in order to sustain your landings and your, your profit margins. So this is a classic case of overfishing where landings have declined since the Fisheries Reform Act of 97 by 80%. And crab pots, especially those that are lost and ghost fishing, create significant but unassessed mortality on crabs, not only crabs, but the fishes that go in to feed on the crabs and then they can't get out and the crabs, the cycle continues with the crabs come back in with the fish there. And so the ghost fishing is a significant problem that's completely unassessed. And we're talking millions of crab pots in the water in North Carolina. And a large and a large number are lost each year by getting hit by boat props and cutting the lines and those kinds of things that where we lose the pots. And a lot of times if they're in a high current, the pots will roll and they'll roll up the, the buoy line and drive the buoy under the surface of the water to where the fisherman can't find his crab pots. And so those, those ghost pots can, can cause significant habitat damage from rolling around the bottom, but also the ghost fishing problems. And of particular concern to these lost crabs pots and crab pots in general is the loss of our one estuarine turtle species, the diamondback terrapin um, in crab pots. The, this species is of special concern to the Wildlife Resources Commission but management actions in coastal waters were delayed for years and only addressed a fraction of the problem. Um, and, and this is the, one of the reasons why we feel that this, this jointly managed resource, the Diamondback Terrapin, instead of having two agencies fighting over what's in their best interest on how to manage Diamondback Terrapins, allowing Diamondback Terrapins to be managed for what is in their best interest and in the best interest of the resource, by a single agency takes a lot of that squabbling out of the picture. But the failure to properly manage the blue crab fishery, in my opinion, is a classic case of the tragedy of the commons. And it's one exam, it's an example that I use extensively in my class on marine resource management and policy. The next slide 
is um, looking at Southern Flight. I'll go back real quick, Luke, if you will, to the, I just want them to see the, you know, we're talking 1994-ish. We saw this, you know, we started seeing this huge increase in the number of pots being used. And, 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 and that was sort of the genesis of the Fisheries Reform Act was to try to resolve this blue crab problem, which was the biggest fishery in the state, our most valuable fishery in the state that employed numerous pickers and people that processed these crabs. And as, that, as the stock started to decline there, you see, in the late 90s, in order to make up, the number of pots went up. So while the fishermen back in the early 90s might have been fishing a, a big time crabber, might have been fishing three or 400 pots. Now we've got some commercial fishermen in certain areas that may be fishing as many as 2,000 pots. And so, and not catching, but 10%, 15%, 20% of the crabs that they used to catch with three or four times the effort. Sorry, Luke, thanks. Go back to the next slide. Am I doing the right old time? Yeah. Okay. Um, the flounder, southern flounder is one that has been in the news and, and that everybody's upset about. Um, that, that fishery management plan was developed in 2006. So you can see from the landings there, they had already started to decline and had gone about halfway down the, the trend line there since, since, the, since the peak in the, in the mid-90s. And that had a lot to do with the advent of the gillnet fishery and the expansion of the gillnet fishery and you know many of these many of these fishermen were were fishing as much as 2000 3000 yards of gillnet per operation so when you start adding all that effort up the number of miles of gillnet in the estuary waters in the southern flounder fishery was astronomical and the and the decline began occurring early on and 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 now, 20 years later, after the fisheries, the first fishery management plan, the, the recreational fishery lasts, I believe it's two weeks now, with a one fish limit. Now, it used to be year round, and I think the limit was eight, maybe 10, at like 13 inches. Now, the limit is one fish at 15 inches for two weeks out of the year in September. That's it. That's all that the fishery can sustain now. And the commercial fishery is now limited to about a two-week season. And it used to fish, they used to be able to land southern flounder year-round. So the, the management necessary to rebuild both blue crabs and southern flounder were well-known decades ago. You know, 2006 was almost two decades ago, which is hard to believe. But, the, the, but failure to act. Failure to avoid the financial impacts that could happen, the short-term financial impacts for long-term sustainability have resulted in a, essentially an economic collapse here for Southern Flounder and Blue Crab. So in addition to what we believe to be extreme overcapacity, which means there are just too many people trying to catch too few fish, and overfishing in the Blue Crab and Southern Flounder fishery, um, these species are also a significant proportion portion of the bycatch in the estuarine shrimp water trawl fishery. So to add insult to injury, not only are we not, we're, we're catching too many in the directed fishery, but we're also catching juvenile southern flounder, juvenile blue crabs, but also Atlantic croaker, spot, wheat fish, kingfishes, and hundreds of other estuarine dependent fishes, shellfishes and crustaceans that are caught as bycatch in the fishery. And so what does that mean for our ecosystem, the, the estuarine ecosystem of, of North Carolina? Next slide, please. <clears throat> this was a slide that I had in to just show you this is what, this can be the impact of a, a, when the diamondback terrapins get in the crab pots, they, they can't get out and they have to breathe air so that they drown. And there have been situations where some pots have had as many as, you know, eight to 10 dead terrapins in, in a single pot. Sorry about that. Keep going. Next slide. So our, our estuarine ecosystem, what I'm talking about there is a, is a complex array of various habitats that support the protection and growth of all of our estuarine dependent um, resources, marine resources, as well as 
the, the lesser species or a lot, what a lot of people like to call trash fish, which I don't like that term, but many of the species that provide food and prey for these fishes that we like to eat or that we like to catch. Um, many of the small anchovies and silver sides and mummy chogs and a lot of the things that inhabit these, these small little tidal creeks play a critical role in the ecosystem, not just for fish, but for birds and for other, other animals as well. Um, and so the, the, the entirety of the estuary provides those critical functions at some point in the life history of all these species, of fishes and crustaceans and things. And unique to North Carolina, as was stated in the, in the video, the, 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 we allow shrimp trawling in these areas that serve as a sink for all the juveniles of many species that come out of the sounds and the rivers and concentrate into Pamlico Sound where they're going to stay for months and grow. They have to do that while at the same time dodging 200, you know, 60 foot, 80 foot steel hole shrimp trawlers pulling 200 feet of shrimp trawl across the bottom. Next slide. So shrimp trawls are, are well documented in the, in the, in the international literature um, as destroyers of bottom habitats. And unfortunately though, in, in the arguments against controlling shrimp trawling, um, many try to compare trawling to plowing a field or no worse than the impacts from a hurricane. The, the, the problem with that argument, they, they talk, I've heard it so many times that I'm, it's almost comical, but that, they, the, the, that, yeah, we've got to plow the bottom like a farmer plows his field. And that, that helps stir up the bottom and it helps growth. Well, initially that might be true if you go out and make one trawl in an area, you, you, you will likely see some increased productivity on that site right after you trawl it. But what we're talking about here is trawling every day. So if you're trawling every day, it's just like if you're plowing your field every day, you're not gonna have a whole lot of crop at the end of the season if you've been plowing your field every day. And it's just like those that say that, yeah, well, bottom trawling is no really no more impactful than a hurricane, but, we don't want to have hurricanes every day either. And so we're talking about, you know, we're talking about huge habitat destructions that are, are, are that everyone tries to make out like, well, it's not a problem. And I can tell you that if you could see the changes in the in the in the seafloor, especially in areas where you have oyster material and you have live live corals and, and sea fans and sea whips. And you, you see this forest basically under on the bottom. It's just like clear cutting a, an old growth forest. You, you, you come across the top of it with these huge doors with these steel, with these chains and these nets across the top and it completely wipes it out. So it's gonna take you years of not trawling on that area at all to rebuild some of the, some of the interstitial spaces and the heterogeneity of the bottom that's so critical as juvenile fisheries habitat for shrimp and crabs and juvenile fishes. Next slide, please. So when we talk about bycatch, based on studies that were conducted in North Carolina, shrimp only comprise about 20% of the catch from shrimp trawls. Now that usually shocks people but I'm not sure they really fully understand what that means. The, the remaining 80% are primarily juvenile fishes that are discarded dead or the waiting predators that follow the boats, such as birds and dolphins and sharks and predatory fishes. During the most complete characterization study that's been done in North Carolina of the estuary and shrimp trawl fishery, they found that vessels in the fishery in 2014 Average 60 feet in length and pulled nets that were 153 feet across for an average tow time of three hours. All right, so you can imagine a four inch spot, three inch spot being dragged through the water for three hours with another 10,000 pounds of fishes and crabs and shrimp and everything mashed together in the, in the tail bag. Then 
drawn up through the water, raised to the surface where the net rocks and the fish are swimming out and the predators are feeding on them. If you've ever seen the back of a shrimp boat, you know when the net comes up because all the birds come down. And then that net is placed on the back deck of the trawler. And then that net's lifted up in the air, a lot of pressure, crushing down on these animals that are in the tail bag. And then they get dropped into the culling tray, the board where they flip flop around. And most of the time, you wait until a lot of the flipping and flopping stops so that if there's jellyfish and that kind of thing in the, in the catch, you're not going to get it all sprayed in your face and that kind of thing. All right. So you wait half an hour. I've seen them wait 45 minutes to an hour before they start culling the catch. It's all been sitting here on the back deck in a box, dry. And then they start culling the shrimp because that's what they're after is the shrimp. And then once they get through a mass of fish with shrimp in it, then they push the fish overboard. And down there at the bottom of the boat, in the waters waiting, is sharks, dolphins, birds, et cetera, et cetera. So during the 2014 study, 49,000, 50,000 pounds of shrimp were caught. 210,000 pounds of juvenile fish were caught. So expanding the observed catches to the total effort in the fishery based on the DMF trip ticket program, 17 million pounds of mostly juvenile fish were harvested to get 4 million pounds of shrimp. And, and those fish will really provide no ecological benefit at all because they're all juvenile fish they will have never spawned and so some people will say well the blue crabs have got to eat too well something's causing the blue crabs are not hurting for food in pamlico sound so it's not that the crabs need more to eat they need to be caught less but so using a conservative average of about 20 fish to the pound i come up with a with a estimate of about, where is it? Let's see, 16, 17 million pounds of bycatch, fish bycatch translates to 338 million juvenile fish that were brought on board the trawl. So it's well established that many of those juvenile fishes that do not come on board are washed out of the net or haul on haul back. They're consumed by the many other fishes. Um, and so I think that the actual number is actually much higher than that because you're not accounting for all the fish that are leaving the net as the net's coming up. And so there's a tremendous additional amount of mortality that occurs before the net even gets on board where you can count them, if, that's, if that makes sense. Um, the next slide, please. Um, oh, I don't know how that got edited. Yeah, I'm sorry. If y'all look at that again, that's a good... Um, Summary. Um, I forgot that was on there. The so we're the only state, the only state that allows this to happen. Every other state has removed shrimp trawling from its estuary nursery grounds. And as many of you may know, Pamlico Sound has always been touted as one of the the most productive estuaries in the world, and it used to be, and it used to supply fishes not only for North Carolina but it also helped supply the South Atlantic and the Mid-Atlantic. And now we're seeing these population trends in our general area of the coast, not just North Carolina, but from Maryland and Virginia and South Carolina, Georgia and Florida, we're seeing these huge declines in these fisheries. And I think a lot of it has to do with the fact that the Pamlico Sound is no longer able to function as the nursery grounds it once was. So the solutions. The conclusions. Um, there is no ecological or scientific defense from my perspective. There is no ecological or scientific defense for continuing to allow shrimp trawling on the documented nursery grounds for numerous valuable juvenile fin fish, crab, and shrimp populations. No defense. The recommendations from our federal and regional fishery management councils 
and Atlantic States Marine Fisheries Commission is that we not allow these gears in our, in our nursery areas. So why would we appear to gloss over the documented facts that many of our most imperiled species, such as spot, croaker, and wheatfish, are the greatest source of fishing mortality for those stocks on the entire East Coast is the shrimp trawl fishery. So when you look at the stock assessment for, say, Atlantic croaker, the number one source of mortality is not commercial fishing, is not recreational fishing. It's shrimp trawl bycatch, where all of that fish is wasted. It's not being used to feed the public trust. It's not being able for, for commercial interest of the public trust, for recreational interest. It's just wasted. Bycatch reduction devices, which we really didn't hit on, and I can ask, ask questions, we can ask answer questions about that down the road, but bycatch reduction devices, which are required in these trawls, they've had no measurable positive impact on survival or recruitment of these species as evidenced by their consistent decline. We started requiring bycatch reduction devices in shrimp trawls in 1993, I believe it was. And you would have thought that had we put in these devices to reduce the bycatch by 50%, which is what they were touted to do, that we would see some improvement in the populations. And we're not. They're continuing to decline to collapse. And so I think the persistent trawl effort in the estuary nurseries of our state reduces the likelihood that any juvenile fishes escape to the to the marine areas, which is where they try or they're trying to go. So they start off in these little creeks. As they grow, they gradually move into Pamlico Sound. And then in the fall, they move off into the ocean to join the overwintering groups. And in many cases, those fish spawn will spawn for the first time but not if they don't make it. And that's what's happening. Um, so the solution, uh, next slide, I won't go through it. The states, I've already been through the other, this, the, based on our analysis and review um, of all the available literature that we've reviewed, it is clear that closing North Carolina estuary waters that serve as critical nursery habitat for hundreds of species to shrimp trawling is consistent with all the available literature to rebuild these imperiled stocks and restore these critical habitats. Um, closing nursery habitats to trawling activity is consistent with the recommendations of the federal and interstate fishery management councils and commissions, is precautionary and in the best interest of the ecosystem and the public trust. So if, if we could spend days um, discussing all the information that led to this recommendation. Um, North Carolina Wildlife Federation has been working with numerous partners um, to develop this package of the video and some, some public uh, affairs, public relations information on trying to get the powers that be to listen, to understand the critical nature of this, because I hate to see it. And, and, and I've seen it go from, uh, there were days where you used to could go out and actually snag flounder on the bottom as they were, as they were swimming through the inlets, they were so thick, you could take a weighted hook and snag them and people would catch them by the cooler fools. And now we're down to one fish two weeks out of the year or a two week season for the commercial fishery and all of our species that are, that are supposed to be managed by our state, for our state, have all, are all showing this same general trend. And so what we're doing is not working. And the solutions that we're proposing, we think will go a long way towards starting to rebuild um, these collapsed and collapsing fisheries. So thank you, um, and we'll see if there's, oh, the landings page, we've got our information on the Wildlife Federation website. Um, all this information we're trying to consolidate, combine, if you have it, you know, there's, all, there's so much information on there. If, you, if you're interested, um, that's the place to find it is on our uh, Sound Solutions and Save Our Sounds um, websites. It, it, it's critical, one, and the reason it's critical, and I, I'll make my final plug here, 
on this. I did this for a long time as a state as a state employee and as the division director. And what I heard more times than not when I went to the legislature and I've had to speak to these legislators, especially those that were from east west of 95, was we've never heard from our constituents about these issues. Nobody, nobody seems to care about this. That's what I want to try to fix. That's what I think the chapters can help us fix. We need to make sure that people are aware and that our legislators can't go back and tell the division, well, we, you know, we haven't heard from anybody in White County about this issue. You know, this is a coastal issue. You know, no, it's not. It's a, it's a North Carolina issue. It's just as much an issue as red wolves and elk and pollinators and everything else that we're trying to deal with. A healthy estuarine ecosystem benefits our state in ways that we may not even know right now. And especially with the issues coming up with global warming and sea level rise and those types of things, if you believe that stuff, could have some of these some of these things we're changing could have substantive positive impacts down the road for our future future generations. So I'm off my soapbox now. Shut up. Thank you, Lewis. So um those numbers are alarming and you touched on this, the solutions that at the very end, but um, a question that comes to my mind just right off the bat is, have we reached a point of no return? Is there a feasible path to recovery? That's a good question. And, and I think, I think, yes, we, we, one of the, what I believe has happened is that we've reduced our spawning stock biomass down to very low levels in the ocean, adult fish. We've seen a huge reduction in the age structure of the population. So we're not seeing the larger, older fish. And the larger, older females are the ones that really drive the reproduction success. And so overfishing has reduced the, the, the spawning stock biomass of these populations. And then the shrimp trawls come in and take out the subsequent recruitment. And so it's kind of a double whammy of what's going on. If we were to allow these juvenile fishes to survive, and spawn just once. It kind of goes back to maybe some of you, hopefully some of you have heard of our Let Them Spawn campaign, where we tried to get the legislature to require size limits that would allow the fish to spawn at least once before you harvest them. I mean, you don't have to be a PhD in wildlife management or fisheries management to know that if your parents didn't have children, neither will you. And so it's critical that we allow these fish, especially those that are declining, you know, the nice thing about these things is they're very, they're, they're, they only live to be eight. Now, most of these fish only live to be six, eight, 10 years old. And they're still one and two year old reproductive, you know, they mature at an early age. And so they have the capacity to come back. We just have to give them the opportunity to come back. But if we're constantly trying, just bombarding them with effort from all sides, then we're not going to see that rebuilding and that recovery that's going to result in a resilient population, which is defined as a stock that has a good age structure and a good spawning stock biomass. Thank you, Lewis. We have a lot of questions. We'll try to get to as many as we can. I hear you on the 815 cutoff time. Uh, Michael has a question in the chat saying, what are the politics driving the legislative inaction on protection of estuaries? And we had a couple of questions that were similar in that regard. It, 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 I mean, from my experience and, and, you know, I, I serve as the, as the technical advisor to the, to the North Carolina Wildlife Federation. So I'm not, you know, I don't, I, I can advise, but I'm not really the policy decider, but, but from my experience, it's the politics is money. It, it, it's the economic impacts. And, and what I have seen is that there's very, hes there's very, there's a great hesitancy at the Marine Fisheries Commission level and the legislature to come step in and take the action that will result in short-term economic costs. And, and, and for that reason, you know, and, and why that's diff, why it's not the same for say, you can't go and buy and sell a largemouth bass. You can't go buy and sell a deer or a turkey. You know, those are, those are public trust resources. So why can you go and buy these other species, especially if they're imperiled, if they're not able. So 
I mean, politically, from my from my experience, it's just been the economic impacts to the industry if you were to cut the harvest. And is there an example of a of a success story with you know another state that banned this destructive shrimp trawling method? Are are we replicating another campaign, or is the Save Our Sounds is that unique? No, the Save Our Sounds is campaign is is unique because I mean we we're, we're so I mean it's been I mean I don't know Virginia banned trawling in Chesapeake Bay. 30, 40, 50 years ago. Um, South Carolina stopped it in the 80s. Um, Georgia stopped it in the 50s. Um, Florida stopped it in the early 90s. And so, you know, how their, how their local fish populations are faring compared to ours. I mean, I think you can look at, I'll give you a good example. In North Carolina, if you, Luke, if you and I want to go out and catch red drum, speckled trout, and flounder in North Carolina. If we go out there, we're allowed one drum, one flounder two weeks out of the year, and four speckled trout. If we go to South Carolina, Georgia, or Florida, we get 10 speckled trout, four or five red drum, and eight to 10, maybe 15 flounder. So, why would people why would people elect to go fishing in North Carolina? Who's going to charter a boat to go flounder fishing when you can't harvest any? Who, who's going to pay? Who's going to go and spend the night at Harker's Island and pay the hotel bills and the grocery bills, et cetera, to go out and gig one flounder for two weeks out of the year? So that's that's part of the issue. Well, you showed those those I mean really alarming graphs at the beginning. And you know, I guess it was the mid 1990s when those numbers were really peaking. Was there anybody crying out, anybody saying like, hey, there's no way these these numbers are sustainable? Or was that was that just silenced right away? Yeah, no, I think I think that, that was part of the that was part of the genesis of the Fisheries Reform Act was was a recognition that we're, we're catching 60 million pounds of blue crabs. We don't know that that's a sustainable number. And if we continue on this path, then we're going to have a problem. And so that's why. So what happened was, is we sat down and we developed the fishery management plan in 1998, 1999. And we recommended, OK, we're going to have a maximum of 500 pots. Now, that seemed like a lot at the time, all right, because we had some people that were fishing three, 350, but there were a few people fishing 500. So we were like, okay, let's cap it while we're fishing 65 million pounds. Let's cap it. Let's keep people from increasing effort and let's protect some more of the female spawning crabs. And let's do some, let's, we had a whole suite of options that we felt were necessary, the division felt was necessary in order to protect the crab fisher. And the, the, the fisheries groups, the lobbyists for the commercial fishing industry opposed it all. And, and at the end of the day, when the votes were taken, the only measure that was passed in the original blue crab fishery management plan was you couldn't use floating line on your crab pots anymore. So, not, and, and to this day, now there's been three amendments to the blue crab fishery management plan since the original. And we still have no pot limit. And we've got overcapacity, we've got overharvest of all these stocks. And so that's, I mean, and that's what's going on in a number of our fisheries. Flounder today are open, but when they open, there's no limit on the amount of flounder you can harvest. So when you give people carte blanche to go out and set as much gear as they want and catch as many fish as they want. That's inconsistent. I, I believe there's no other state on the East Coast that has higher than a 300 pot limit on blue crabs, and we have no limit. I could keep asking questions, but I'll dip into the Q&A here. Bill asks, is a fishery any place where, where we, any of us, can catch fish, or is it a specific designated place where commercial fishers fish? Sounds like a riddle. Oh no! I mean, if it's, I mean, in North Carolina, in North Carolina, our waters are designated coastal, which is the ocean from zero to three miles. So from the beach out three miles is state waters, and then 
the estuary is the sounds and the rivers up to the line that delineates between North Carolina Division of Marine Fisheries and the Wildlife Resources Commission. So as long as you don't go into the Wildlife Resources Commission's inland waters, you can commercial fish. There are very few places. There are places where you can't trawl. There are places where you can't trawl on grass beds. You can't trawl in primary nursery areas in these little small creeks, all right? But the problem is, is that all the fish have ultimately come out of those seagrass beds and out of those creeks and into the Pamlico Sound where the trawling activity occurs. And so you might be protecting them from, from half an inch up to three inches, but once they get up to the size that they move into the Pamlico Sound that's open to trawling, it's gone. Who are the obstructionists? Does that question resonate with you? I, you know, I think I think I think it I think a lot of the problem is the everybody has an interest that serves on the Marine Fisheries Commission. They're either recreational fishermen that have a financial interest as the as the recreational industry see, recreational fishermen that are representing the recreational people, there's commercial fishermen. You know, the vast majority of the people on that are making the decisions have a vested interest in the fishery. And it's important to have people that have an understanding and a knowledge of the fishery. But when they're making the decisions on what's in the best interest of the resource, oftentimes it's just human nature to say, no, you know, I can't vote for this because if I vote, if I vote for reducing this harvest, I can't go home. Or if I vote to allow the, rec the commercial fishermen to catch more fish, the recreational guys are going to be mad at me and vice versa. So what you find is they come up, what, what we end up with oftentimes is status quo because it's the most politically expedient thing to do. So we've just left it all sitting there and we kind of nibble around the edges of what needs to be done, but have failed to take the necessary action to protect these resources because it will have significant impacts on the commercial and the recreational fishery if we do take those actions. But yet, if we look back in history, we didn't hesitate to Im implement the Migratory Bird Treaty Act in 1919 that prevented you from selling ducks and hunting shorebirds. You know, we had all these game laws that have protected these things. And yes, people are going to, people that were market gunners had to come up and find a different way, but they mostly ended up guiding duck hunters, you know, instead of selling ducks. And so there are opportunities here to look at industry, to look at aquaculture, to look at eco-touring, to look at guiding, to doing things that are more sustainable as opposed to the large scale efforts and the recreational fishery. We, we, we cannot point the, the we, we have to recognize that with the increasing recreational pressure, discards from the recreational fishery is a big problem. And in many species of fish that are important to a lot of us, the actual discard mortality rate from the recreational fishery exceeds the commercial harvest in some fisheries. So, you know, that's why I said the, the three main points of the Sound Solutions Program, it doesn't address it all. But we feel like if we can address these three things, the, the license structure, the, the management structure, and the shrimp trawl bycatch, then we can start looking at how do we reduce recreational discards? How do we deal with gill nets and bycatch of sea turtles? And how do we deal with a lot of these other problems that we recognize are there, but we can't fight them all at the same time? Chad is wondering, can't there, can't there be a rule for the shrimp fishermen to move away from the shallow waters into the deeper water for their catch? Well, the, well one of the proposals has come out. I mean, what, and what the other states have done, what South Carolina, Georgia, and Florida have done is they allow their shrimpers in the ocean. And, and, and so that's where, you know, and so that's the place where the, 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 the juvenile fish in the estuary are given safe harbor. And, and the beautiful thing about that, from an ecosystem standpoint, is that then those shrimp and those small fishes and those crabs serve their ecological function of being prey for many other species in the estuary as opposed to bycatch. 
And then, but keep in mind that the shrimp that are in the estuary that we're catching in the estuary too are juveniles. They're not going to spawn until they get in the ocean. So by waiting and allowing the shrimp fishery to operate once the shrimp get into the ocean, oftentimes you're, 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 you're resulting in a larger shrimp, which tends to be a more valuable shrimp, but you're also not harvesting all the fish in these small little isolated areas like Pamlico Sound. Once those fish get in the ocean, they can really distribute out and the bycatch is not as significant a problem as it is when they're in the constrained, confined estuary. So assuming, or hypothetically speaking, this is a successful campaign and we are effective in stopping this method of shrimp trawling, of shrimping. What are the steps or how do we ensure that things don't revert back to those old destructive methods after a handful of years? Well, I mean, that, that's, that's, that's always a problem. And, and I think that, you know, one of the things that we tried to do was, you know, think about this. All right, you say no shrimp trawling in the sound. And then all of a sudden, all these little fish become available to the commercial and the recreational fishery. Well, if you haven't protected them with a size limit to make sure that they can spawn at least one time, then all you've done is transferred that mortality from the shrimp trawls to the gill netters and the recreational hook and liners and people that are going to catch them. So you've got to come up with ways to manage for success. That's the reason why, as we were working on the shrimp trawl bycatch issue, we proposed the let them spawn bill. And what the let them spawn bill was 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 aimed to do, and it passed the House, and then it, it, then it never was heard in the Senate. But the problem there was we needed size limits on spot croaker, wheat fish, kingfishes, the bulk, the, the major components of the shrimp trawl bycatch so that we didn't have that problem. We know, what, we know how to manage these resources. We've seen successful fisheries management, but it's painful. And one of the problems is, is that in North Carolina, we've allowed it to go so long, I mean, if we look back at 2006 and when we were trying to reduce the flounder harvest, we needed to reduce the flounder harvest by 30% to achieve, to end overfishing and rebuild the stock. And because it would have significant economic impacts, the commission elected only to have about a 10% reduction. Today, we need an 80% reduction or more in order to make up for the fact that we've gone since 2006 without taking the necessary action. And I use the example in my in my class all the time. I mean, if you if you if you if you're saving for a truck and you need ten thousand dollars and you get to four thousand and you've got more money than you've ever seen in your life and you see a truck that's cheaper and you go ahead and say, well, hell, I'll just buy that truck now at four thousand dollars. Well, you're not going to have a good, solid, usable truck. Right. That's what happens when we start fishing on these stocks before they rebuild. We haven't reached the sustainable level. And so what are we going to hear now as flounder stocks begin to rebuild? People are saying they're seeing more flounder than they've ever seen. Let us catch them. Well, if we do that, then we're going to be right back slide into the same problem that we faced before. And until we use the education and we make people aware and we let the decision makers represent the whole, the entirety of North Carolina, not just the commercial and recreational fishermen. That's the beauty in our minds of the Wildlife Resources Commission is that they have members that are out that represent the entire state, but they don't have a specific requirement to be a commercial fisherman that makes 50 percent of their income from commercial fishing. And so we hope that they and they tend to listen far more, and from my experience, with the science coming from their staff, as opposed to the public comment. And that's the reason why I think in many instances we see some sustainable success stories in our wildlife and inland fisheries management to some degree. And we're not seeing that in our marine fisheries. It kind of gets back to the whole Sound Solutions 3. Trio. You mentioned your class. How do your students respond to this knowledge? They're shocked. They, they, they don't really understand why our state is so different than other states. But 
at the end, I mean, I tell my students if they can give me a better example of a fisheries example of the tragedy of the commons than what's happening in North Carolina, they can have an A for the class and they don't have to come to class. And in eight years, nobody's ever been able to give me a better example than oh, wow. the examples that are used in North Carolina. And so when they find out that, yeah, for every pound of shrimp that they buy at the fish house, there are anywhere from four to eight pounds of juvenile fish that died to result in that. And if they, when they realize that the shrimp trawl, the dominant catch is not shrimp, only 20% of the catch is shrimp. The rest of it is all stuff that has to be thrown overboard. And if anybody thinks any of that bycatch survives that encounter, it doesn't. And, 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 and so that's the, those are the things that they, that really blows their mind. We have a few uh, chapter leaders and plenty of chapter members uh, with NCWF on the call tonight. And Donna was wondering, and she did find the answer to her question, but she was wondering if uh, they could share the video with NCWF chapters so we can you know, share on social media and spread the word. And I guess that brings me to my question. Um, why is this campaign important for the chapters to know about? And I guess to emphasize again, why it's important for the chapters that aren't on the coast. It's important for them as well as the chapters that are on the coast. Yeah, I, th I think it, it it just depends on really what your, what your, what your engagement and your involvement with NCWF is. I mean, North Carolina Wildlife Federation is trying to use good science to protect all of our natural resources, whether they're elk in Maggie Valley or croaker in the sound. And we all have to support one another. So we need our chapters on the East Coast to be on the East Coast to be supporting what's going on in the West. And we need what's going on, you know, and so that's what and what's from my perspective, what's so critical is having those Western chapters, those Charlotte chapters, Raleigh chapters, those folks expressing their concern. And, and, and you don't have to get you don't have to get rabid about it. But at least if your legislators know that you're concerned about it and you would like to see them fix it. Then it gives them that ability to go in and say, yeah, I've heard from my constituents, because what I what I've discovered is, is that if you look at, say, Mecklenburg County. Or even, or even White County, let's use White County because that's a good example. There's 10, 15, 20,000 20, recreational license holders that live in White County. There's like 10 commercial fishermen. There are more senators and legislators that, I mean, senators and house members that represent Raleigh than the entire coast. But yet it's the coastal legislators that are dictating policy on marine fisheries. So if you think about Raleigh and you think about Bass Pro Shop and Cabela's and you think about all the all the all the things that drive the economy. And I mean if I had a dollar for every person from Raleigh that came to Beaufort to go fishing, I'd be a millionaire, multi-millionaire. You know, it's a critical thing for Raleigh. And so it should be a critical thing for their legislators, but the legislators tend to just defer and so if you've got folks from Wake County that are saying, hey, Senator so-and-so or House member so-and-so, this is an important issue to us. We don't want you to keep deferring to the failed policies of the past. We want to we want to see you take take up the arms to protect these resources. And I think that's from my perspective, that's where the chapter opportunities in these types of issues provide us with that overarching state support for conservation. John, I see you have a question. You're welcome to shout it out if you'd like. Yeah, the, the other thing is I uh, have not been able to add any questions in the q and I, I don't know, it just won't let me in, but I guess the, the question I had raising my hand was there was talk about uh, combining agencies and I think maybe putting the Fisheries Commission inside the uh, the Wildlife Commission uh, I know there was talk about that a couple of years ago uh, there was also talk at some point of maybe Governor Cooper stepping in and trying to correct the situation so has has anything changed you know in those areas um 
And not from my not from my understanding. I mean, and 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 what you got to realize is who who makes the call, who makes the call. And and a lot of people, I, I kind of saw questions going across the top of the screen, and so this may help you. Um, who makes the call? Who who decides? And really, it all comes down to the Marine Fisheries Commission is a nine member board that's appointed by the governor. All right, a lot of your boards and commissions are appointed by the, the Wildlife Resources Commission is appointed by the governor, the Speaker Pro Tem, and the Speaker of the House, the Speaker of the, the Senate Pro Tem, and the Speaker of the House. So there's some buy in amongst the legislators to the policymakers on the Wildlife Resources Commission. But in the case of the Marine Fisheries Commission, all the appointments are made by the governor, and they are the deciders. The Division of Marine Fisheries. They collect the information. They make recommendations. We may not agree on their recommendations, and in many instances, we don't agree on their recommendations in certain instances. But it's the Marine Fisheries Commission that makes the decisions, all right? And the, the, the people that oversee the Marine Fisheries Commission, essentially, are the Secretary of the Department of Environmental Quality and the Governor and his staff. And so that's where the problem comes. And the whole intent and purpose behind the Fisheries Reform Act was to get the legislature out of marine fisheries. When they get marine fisheries issues, they, I mean, the, it creates a mess, all right? And so the whole point was to try to have these procedures put in place that would avoid having to go to the legislature. And the exact opposite has happened. So now we're not getting anything out of our Marine Fisheries Commission, in my opinion. We're not, we're not seeing the necessary reductions and changes. And so that's why we need, a, we need a change. We need a fix. We need somebody who oversees that, that's in it and on it day to day, if that helps. Would that, out. Would that require legislative action to create that? There, it's one way of doing it. There are other ways that could, it could be done, um, and 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 you know, I, from what I understand, you know, they can they can do it through different gubernatorial issues and Senate issues. I mean, legislative issues. But yeah, I mean, right now the Marine Fisheries Commission is is it was was created by the Fisheries Reform Act, which is a legislative stat, which is a legislative statute. So now, any few, the yeah, a, a few years ago, uh, sorry, a few years ago, I know the state of Maryland, their blue crab situation was pretty dire. And I think they successfully took uh, corrective action. Uh, but it seems like in North Carolina that that it's great to get these recommendations. But, you know, implementing the recommendations and getting them approved seems to be I mean, a lot of this reminds me of what happened with COD up in uh, Canada, you know, years yep. ago. And it's it's very it's very similar. It's very similar, and 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 that's part of the and that's part of the problem. And and again, I mean, if 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 you're gonna if you're gonna listen, I mean, one of the things if you really look into this deeply, what you'll see is that North Carolina Marine Fisheries is 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 basically managed through public opinion through advisory committees, where the science from the professional biologists at the Division of Marine Fisheries is actually presented to the public and then they have an opportunity to discount it. Well, they don't really have the, the, the expertise to discount it in many instances. They just say, oh, this can't be right. And so you end up getting these votes from the public saying, you know, and the public that attends are the people that have the real vested interests. And so they're the ones that say, ah, we, we don't oppose, we oppose all this. And so then the, 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 the legislatively approved advisory committees have now recommended to the Marine Fisheries Commission to do nothing. And so it creates a problem. So I think it's the whole process. It's the whole process of the fishery management plan. The, the, the Wildlife Resources Commission doesn't have public meetings. They don't have public advisory committees. They rely on their staff to make the decisions and they rely on their staff to, to, to make the changes and the necessary corrections as they go through to make sure the resources are sustainable. And they're, they're not perfect by any stretch of the imagination, but, they're, but, they're, but it's a much better system than having 
an angry group of fishermen come and and dictate policy because they don't want to stop gigging sheep's head or whatever the case may be for that meeting. Monty, you can unmute if you'd like. Yeah. Um, so I'm just curious. It seems like we're you know we kind of we've been stuck in first gear all all this time. Um, <laughs> what's good different? Point. What's different about North Carolina, where we're the only state that allows this? to go on and you know you, you've mentioned south carolina you know georgia florida they've had they they've enacted you know restrictions on this for years what how did they overcome the economic and the political hurdles that we seem incapable of overcoming what what's the difference well georgia did it in the 50s and so they're just wanting the the, the chutzpah from the opponents to to argue it the in south carolina it was put to a vote in Florida, it was put to a vote. Um, you know, it was a, it was led, it was a, it was a, it was on the, it was on the ballot. The, the net ban in Florida was a, was a, was a ballot issue, and and in South Carolina as well. Um, and the people overwhelmingly supported no, no entangling nets, no nets in the estuary. And and I think that what South Carolina did would maybe was a little over the top. Because I think you can still successfully manage these fisheries for everybody. And I think we really want to have the culture and history of the commercial activity in North Carolina that, we, that we've that we had in the past. It just needs to be handled more creatively and less for quantity over qu and, and more for quality. And I think that's the problem. And, 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 and how we've ended up being, you know, I've always asked that question. But I mean, if you look at how North Carolina sits on the coast and Cape Hatteras being the primary one, the primary uh, geographic promontory for the East Coast of the United States, you know, south of Cape Cod and north of Cape Canaveral, that's where everything concentrates in the wintertime. And so we were able to go out there with these trawl nets and the like, and we could catch 50, 60,000 pounds in a single trip, you know, and we did that. And so for a lot of reasons, that's the reason the Atlantic States Marine Fisheries Commission got started getting involved in the 90s and requiring these fishery management plans required by federal law. You had to now comply with these. But we got to keep in mind that a lot of this stuff is fairly, you know, a lot of these, this is not, this is not, you know, sturgeon in the 1800s. Some of these fisheries were virgin fisheries in the 70s. You know, and and through the through the increasing horsepower, through the increasing of electronics, through the fact that you can now use GPS and get to a square of an inch of bottom on the ocean floor, you know, every day go to the same place. I mean, the the technology has 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 created a lot of this as well. And so, I mean, if we went back to cotton nets and dead reckoning, then I don't think we'd have a problem. But you know, we've, we've, and, and, and there's so much more to this, um, you know, that we could get into it. We could have a whole entire discussion on how the fishery changed over the last three decades to where we used to only fish in the estuary. And so everything that got out of the estuary was free to spawn and grow and everything. But then once we started getting the boats and the capacity to go in the ocean and start pursuing them in the ocean, we started pursuing them year round. So you can imagine if we were deer hunting year round or turkey hunting year round or, you know, any of these things, if we, if we started fishing for them year round, then there's never a place where they can go and be safe. And so this idea that the seas are inexhaustible resources is just, you know, is, is, is proven to not be the case. And we're the, and we're the poster child of why. Thank you, Lewis. Um, I guess we're past our time, so we'll, we'll cut off the questions here, but I mean, clearly this is a critical issue, and I think I speak for everyone that we appreciate your work uh, to bring this issue to the surface. The labor of love, That's and I, right. can, I, can't say enough about, I can't say enough about the way the Federation and the way the chapters, and Tara, you've done a masterful job in putting that together, and, and it's just critical that we keep it going and that we reach out to these chapter leaders and that they hear these things and that they let their let their people know that these are issues that everybody needs to be involved with, just like red wolves, just like elk. 
they're all critically important to this great state. And like you said, it's it's a labor of love. It's it's rooted in passion, and that's that's going to drive us. No doubt that's true. It. Yeah. Thank, thank you, thank Lewis, you. so much. Thank you. Oh, it's my pleasure. Thank you very much. Yeah. And thanks very you. much, and I think for everybody, uh, write your uh, write your legislators. Write to the governor. Yes. Too too the bad. Their voices heard. Please, please do something about you know, our marine fisheries. Too bad there's no way of, of letting these people know that they're working themselves out of a job. Yeah, well, all sides too. I mean, it's it's a shame, it's sad. It's just, it, it's human history repeating itself. Yep. But we'll get there, I think. I think we'll get there. I hope we do. So yeah. thank you for your time. I appreciate it very much. All right, great presentation. Thank you. Well, thank, thank you, you so guys. Much. Yeah, appreciate it. Night. Thank you, Luke. I appreciate you, buddy. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, Luke.